intro to cybersecurity, uh, I am not Dan Massey, as many of you probably know. Uh, Dan, unfortunately, uh, got a stomach virus and is out. Um, and so I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Jerry Weisler. Geisler. I blew that already. Um, thank you, Nolan. Um, Jerry Geisler, who is the CISO of Walmart. Now, I don't know about you, but technology, cybersecurity, and policy is really important. It's pervasive in all of that. Cybersecurity is also. But when I think of Walmart, I do not think of cybersecurity. I do not think of a lot of technology. I think of point of sale. I think I go there, I buy a cup or something like that. I was wrong. What he's going to tell us today is about Walmart and the infrastructure that Walmart has. It involves technology, cybersecurity, and policy at scale. It's a place where many of you may have never thought about working for, but after this talk, I suspect that some of you will broaden your view of what Walmart does. Please take a second and welcome Jerry Geisler, who is the CISO of Walmart. Please. Thank you. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. I, I actually kind of like Jerry Weisler. It makes me feel like I've earned all these gray hairs. I'm, 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 I, might, I might use that. Uh, hey, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, Nolan and I have been colleagues um, over the years, and, and he reached out to me and asked if I'd come and talk, and, you know, and I was certainly more than happy to do so. Um, I'm very informal, even though I'm wearing a jacket. Please, I want this to be an interactive section um, with myself and my team members who are joining me virtually. So as you have questions, please you know, feel free to, to jump in. And um, since I'm mic'd, I'll do my best to repeat them for those that are attending virtually. So I'll tell you a little bit about Walmart that you, you may not realize just to set the context. So I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Walmart, and when people think about Walmart, um, we recognize that you very often will think of the store or maybe the dot-com website, and that's typically all the further that we think. But when you think about a company like Walmart, what you may not realize is it's massive. It is, it's an extraordinarily large company. So if we talk just for a moment about the footprint, the physical footprint of the stores, we're talking 5,000 domestic locations. Um, if we talk globally, we're talking 11,500 locations, every one of which has some technology footprint in that physical location. So 11,500 store locations with some type of technology footprint and, of course, interconnectivity that ties all of them together. We have retail operations in 28 countries. Um, you're likely familiar with the Walmart brand, but you may not be familiar with the other 68 brands that we do business under around the globe. A number of companies that you would not recognize the name of if you didn't live um, within that country. So we operate in a number of different locations um, under a number of different brands. Outside of the stores, though, you have um, a massive logistics network, what we call distribution centers. Um, you have, of course, have the e-commerce platforms. You have um, sourcing operations around the globe for um, finding goods that end up in the stores or on the website. You have the platform services for third-party sellers. Um, you have a workforce of almost 2.5 million people that work for the company. If we're talking technology footprint, um, if you look at our network, we have about 3 million nodes on the network at any given point, um, spread across about 200 million active IP addresses. When you look at that, in the macro view, it can be daunting. Um, when you start to try and address security posture or attack surface, it can be daunting because you, you sit and you think, wow, where do, where do I even start? 
an environment that massive. Um, I had a conversation, if you're familiar with Bruce Schneier, he's a well-known cryptographer, writes a lot of books. Um, when he talked to me one day about um, security at Walmart and he talked about just the employee base, he said, you know, even, even if you're operating at a Six Sigma level um, of everybody doing the right things, you still have two or two and a half people at any given point doing something that you absolutely don't want them doing within your environment. And that's true, you know, and, and the challenge becomes, how do you identify those types of things to mitigate that risk and how do you protect a user population of two and a half million people from very active adversaries, some of which are known, some of which are unknown? Um, how do you meet all your regulatory obligations? But most importantly, how do you enable your business? You know, because the business is, exists to deliver goods and services to consumers and sometimes in very innovative ways. Um, I was sharing with somebody earlier that it, the way that we have to think about it is the things our business is doing to create value are very often the same exact things that create risk in our world. But we can't take the position of no or no, you can't do that um, because that's not why the company exists. So we have to figure out how do we, in an innovative way, enable the business to go forward and execute against their goals and objectives to realize that competitive advantage or to deliver those goods and services. And, and of course, you have to do it at scale. Now, my colleagues that are joining me today, they're out of um, our security operations practices. So they're going to provide for you some real world examples as to how we look at some of these things um, at a scale uh, of Walmart within a, a massive IT environment. I don't think I mentioned it. We have probably 12,000 technologists that work with, within the company. Um, so, you know, of two and a half million people, you've got that many people that work just in tech. And I would, I would venture a guess that probably most of you wouldn't have thought that Walmart has 12,000 technologists uh, working for it. And we have locations all over. So we, we've got East Coast locations, West Coast locations, Midwest locations, and of course we have teams all around uh, the globe as well, broken up across about 20 different programs and practices within information security, um, everything you would expect within an engineering organization, internet security, network security, endpoint security, cloud security, cryptography, um, identity and access management, which as I mentioned, two and a half million users, identity and access management, and managing the entitlements that go along with that many users, that's, uh, that's a big job in and of itself. Um, we have a, a vulnerability assessment area that, that runs our AppSec programs, our bug bounty programs, our penetration testing, um, our red teaming, uh, and a number of other programs that fit uh, into that space. And then joining us today is our security operations leadership team. Um, within that is our security operations center, our incident responders, our threat hunters, our cyber intelligence practices, our data assurance practices, um, and our uh, forensics and e-discovery uh, laboratories. So that's a high level view. Um, we have about 700 security practitioners uh, within, within my organization, um, all working on their part of the mission, um, but ultimately you know, working together really in unanimity of purpose and and that purpose is to ensure that we're enabling our business to execute against its mission um, in a secure way. Um, you know, pr protecting the brand and reputation of the company, protecting the data of our customers and our associates, and protecting the data of the company itself. So joining me, uh, any questions on any of that so far? Okay, joining me is uh, Jason O'Dell. Uh, who is our senior director of our SecOps teams. Um, Harold Ogden, who is uh, one of our senior engineers, and Vernon Habersetzer, who is also uh, a senior engineer. I want to make sure we have time left at the end because really these guys are way more interesting than I am, and they're going to walk you through things that candidly are probably more interesting than anything I've told you so far. Um, so I think, you'll, I think you'll really enjoy hearing uh, their portion, and then, um, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. And again, same thing. Um, if you have a question, you know, raise your hand. I'll, I'll 
I'll get to you and I'll make sure to repeat the question so that the team online can hear it. So, Jason. So in the spirit of what Jared said, I'm going to uh, not take very much time, and I'm going to hand it over to people that are much smarter than I am um, to go and address some of the things that we have when we're talking about addressing things at scale. Um, and Jerry spoke a lot to scale as he was going through and, and providing an overview of information security here at Walmart. Um, and you know, he, he listed the different brands that we have as an example. Um, but what a lot of other people don't realize is beyond retail, Walmart also has energy companies and we have banks. And so when we think overall, we're seeing a lot of different threats um, with a lot of different threat actors. And when you look at the volume of data we're processing, how can you execute on that effectively? So as an example, if you look at this one, you're 19 for us, uh, we process a little over 6 trillion events. And if you mind, those are not taxes or events, right? Um, but this is what you're pushing in by January the 31st. We're going to process a little bit more to 7.2 uh, trillion events. And so when you look at the velocity and, and you look at organic increases, um, uh, as well as increases that we have in our investment processing, things like workers and acquisitions, those of you who are going to be probably seeing the entire line of e commerce companies, like, how do we effectively execute on and, and do so in an automated fashion and do so? So, Vernon uh, and Harold are going to kind of give you a couple of ways that we've tried to tackle. Um, you know, Harold is talking through our automated Maldoc analysis process. And it, this is a really interesting, um, you know, opportunity to do because if you look at it a couple of years ago, um, he and another gentleman team were just trying to address how do you go and be analyzing a lot of different maldocs and how do we do that more effectively? And so on from this kind of like, how do we increase automation to now get into other indicators of compromise that we distribute to our various controls internationally, uh, far surpassing any of the paper threat fees that we have today. And, and it also is the inside in tracking cyber out series, I was told like I was up in discussion with some of the primary uh, campaigns that this is. In terms of the perspective, how do we address this on a public scale and even when we give our data? And Ernest going to talk about it. So we have three different kind of categories on the network. How do you find the two that are bad? Like the two that are bad, and not only the two that are bad, maybe, but the commoditized control that we have as well. So, how do you think TTPs, but also looking at the activities. So, in other words, we understand in one of the philosophies that we execute on is we know that rare is not always bad, but a bad is invariably going to be rare. Um, and so, that's one of the foundations of our program, program taking this problem of case we have these massive data sets and we look at and attend using the data to our advantage. So, That's a that's an Thank you. Uh, so, to, to take off here, I'm sure you all have some documents and pushing campaigns. These are all for you today. Especially since. So, this is a distributed. Earlier today, about 34 hours ago, it's distributing malware called Predator the Thief. Um, there's a really um, awesome benefit to being in retail and financial services, and that the just um, you know, like us as an organization, generally don't target just us. Um, we have a cyber intelligence team that keeps us up to speed on how these trends uh, move. As of right now, these campaigns generally, um, the vast majority of them target small market target. We have all kinds of services. We try to monetize and either it's all ransom money. So we can take advantage of that. These other organizations are hit and these are samples to our sole products to our services. We can have a look into those and jobs we should do. So I'll see you touch on the social media. This is trucking. 
Sorry, we're going to take you to that. Copy cell. Agency. This process is being handled to the team. So this process allows us to see if you can do this process. So, just to progress the poll, where's this file from? I'll be getting from Microsoft, MileShare, or as of this week, reversing last number of sources, and it works by all the places you pull most of the files from. And this is the count every hour, so we're getting, I was doing one in 200 files every hour that are distinct hitting other companies around the world. We can get a screen of them that have been automatically reversed, showing up in our direct sharing platform. Now, every single one of these, uh, we used to go analyze by hand. Two years ago, for these campaigns, and we would go through and we would analyze, let's see here, we would go through and have to look at the malicious code and by hand try to figure out what the how, what the point of, what the main was going to be out to, where the power came from. We can get through 20, 30, 40 a day, but it was uh, nowhere near the quality of the city industry. And now we're getting, uh, we're getting uh, one to 200 an hour from all these different sources. Now, whenever these files get analyzed, they show up in our system, and it's already been reversed and analyzed, and then these things get to one of our cyber intel team. Um, I would have to get this by hand uh, normally, but I can show it and look at the flow of these. We have this, this domain here. Uh, Coltfed12.site is, in this case, probably stood up by the adversary to distribute. And if I search for that, I'm going to search for that into on our internal portal. Um, this is another internal portal. Um, this was really to address the fact that we have lots of uh, analysis on the paper to determine that. And everyone have like 10, 15 Chrome tabs open. Go do the searches in all the different tabs. Decision, have an idea of how they make the decision. So you have an audit trail as to what research is being performed. Now I do the search and that's all audited. Uh, you can see that there are um, 158 chip on the dot site and zero people who search for this domain. No one else is probably in the paper, which in this case is good because we're going to be able to I can also see here, you know, people see. Um, you know, people just talking to this domain is your name, right? So you get all that information in one place. I'm able to do SDS. I can click there and search. This IP address is not being considered malicious uh, by our like, open DNS feed, so it would not be necessarily prevented, except I have a record here that our cyber intelligence team back on the uh, 11th of November. Uh, all this because it was already hosting out an hour. So, to whether or not I think this needs to be actioned, um, this would have been able to automatically processes we got in place. And this happens just all day every day without any annual interaction. It has to be done. You see all the different files that are going into our system. They're nice and tiny. You know, just actors change the behavior. Uh, they, they work kind of by the system. Software. And so when they make changes, sometimes they make changes for automatic analysis, not necessarily. Just handles and throws these files. It's a Python application that makes it basic. And since we're emulating it, it's often things that have to be adjusted. Uh, for us, the primary maintainer now of Python on feed is Haley uh, Kurtzhaber, my, my colleague who maintains that. It's now being used by the Department of Defense and some other We're trying to keep it. It's used in our campaigns, but it is a moving um, So I'll just close the tab. Let's see how that works. So one of the things that we can see too, since we it's nice for it to take care of that all the 
documents. There's like a one, and each color is a different malicious document campaign. This is based on the inside the documents. This is not based on what they This is based on the image of the users. You see the outlines of this single document campaign on the switch. And see with respect of our class business, these uh, hackers also do. So we generally have work to do every Tuesday or Wednesday to make sure this is how that happens. Yeah, and as Harold mentioned, hackers are just normal people. We see typically during the holidays they're going to take her off. Um, they took a lot of time off around Christmas, and now as we enter 2020, the last year is increasing. Question? Yes, uh, there is a question. Uh, so this is going on 24 7, roughly seven days a week. I mean, Absolutely. And so you guys are just sitting there watching this stuff. Are you exceptional as Walmart? Are other companies also thinking about these kinds of things as well? Yeah, so I think, I think a lot of companies are thinking about these things, and the reason that we've we're highlighting maldocs is if you look at, um, you can go back and read the Verizon data breach report from last year, about mm, 80 to 85 percent of malicious breaches at organizations in the last year have started as what we call business email compromise. So that means an email successfully landed in somebody's inbox, it got past whatever your filtering you had in place, and it had a malicious document that took some type of action within that environment to reach out to a C2 server, install something, et cetera, et cetera. So where we're fortunate is that Kirk Sayer, who maintains the Viper Monkey tool, is part of our organization. So from that respect, we're probably a little ahead in this space. Um, but that's also why you know the tool is open source. There's we don't look to gain competitive advantage by being more secure than somebody else. We're all fighting the same adversaries and the same techniques. So, you know, we share that type of stuff openly. Where I think we may have another advantage is that um, we enjoy broad support from executive leadership to run a, a sophisticated, state-of-the-art, well-funded information security program. In, and as Walmart, you know, we're able to fund that. Not every organization enjoys those same benefits, which again is why, you know, giving back to the community through an open source project like this is so valuable because it doesn't cost anybody anything to do this. Yes, another question. What's the name of the tool again? Viper Monkey. I know he, he cut out when he was talking about it, but it's Viper Monkey. Yes, sir. So is that your typical attack, you know, some... Eastern European, like cyber, you know, gang. Just like I don't. Kind of yeah, I don't. Gainer. I don't know if there is typical anymore. Um, you know, we certainly see plenty out of that part of the world. We tend to see adversaries kind of follow an evolution, if you will. So if you look, if you look at adversary activity, it tends to follow two things: broadband penetration and wealth. Um, it, and that's because adversaries, they're never going to attack you from their own system. They're going to attack you from some botnet that's compromised thousands of other systems that they can just rent. Um, so the crime as a service, if you will, they'll go out, they'll rent a botnet, and that's where they're going to launch their attacks from. So they want good connectivity. So where is their good broadband? And where is there enough wealth that consumers have PCs, sitting in their home running, you know, an out-of-date version of McAfee that's easily compromised, and boom, that's, their, that's their, their launching point. So typically when we look, in, you know, like all SOCs, we have the cool map of the globe where we see the real-time incoming um, attack traffic. That's, you know, they call it VPI candy because I like to see it when I walk in. Um, <laughs> it's true. You'll see it in every SOC. Um, <coughs> when, when we look at that adversarial traffic, the adversary is never typically where the actual attack traffic is coming from. So we will see, you know, APT actors, or more commonly known as nation state attackers, we'll see those attackers um, to some degree as an APT actor, but we're, we're not 
as interesting of a target to that type of adversary. But that adversary very often works on the side, leveraging their professional job-related skill sets for self-enrichment as an individual criminal bad actor. So, you know, if we're looking at act adversaries out of Russia, it's very much crime-related, monetization, et cetera. If we're looking out of um, Asia, it's very often intellectual property theft, um, you know, interest in strategic plans, things along those lines. Central and South America, um, a little more nascent. Um, what we're often seeing there is, you know, the, they're earlier in their evolution as criminals. Um, in that they're trying to establish themselves as legit hackers, so they're still into the website defacements and you know that kind of chaos. But but they're getting better, and they're going to eventually realize, hey, I can monetize this. Um, so you, you'll start seeing the ransomware attacks and other things coming out of that part of the world. We don't see a lot coming out of Africa today. Now, when we do see things come out of Africa, it's almost some type of financial. Uh, scheme, some type of financial crime, but there's not a lot of broadband penetration, especially in greater Africa, so we don't see a lot coming out of that part of the world, but good question. Vernon, I think we were about to hand it off to you. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So um, I'll walk through the Hunt team, um, how we're structured and then the kind of things we do, the tools we use. Um, have questions at the end here. So, um, why do we hunt? Uh, this is a very, the answer to that question is similar to why Harold uh, and Kirk do you know, the things that they were doing with the micro monkey project and the Maldoc work there. It's because security solutions that you go and buy off the shelf are not going to detect everything. In an environment this large, uh, there's a lot of things that can just, you know, go looking for those things yourself. And so that's why Hunt Team exists to try to hunt down those, those types of behaviors that are not going to get caught by traditional solutions. Um, the challenges that Hunt Team faces, um, we mentioned some of this already. A lot of IP addresses, um, 24 billion network connections every day are captured uh, in full PCAP form. PCAP service is really large. You know, and circuits and offices all around the globe, 10 stores, 2 million associates. It's a, it's a large attack service that one associate worked finished successfully and got malware on and cheap. Um, so, a very, very large area to try to hunt across. A lot of this space is used just for port traffic alone, not to count all the computer and telemetry at the endpoints. Um, so, the hunt team is made up currently of eight folks that rotate in and out of the traditional IR side of the team. Um, it's the response side of the team that works cases um, to ground. And so, um, we divide our work up in different attack phases so that we are hunting as efficiently as we can and not duplicating efforts. So right now we're dividing our work up in attack phases. On the screen there are, are examples of that. Um, actually starting next week we're going to be up work a little bit clean, but uh, for us for use something new though coming up soon. Uh, but we do uh, also monthly focus on the team. We will visit out years and areas we want to check. Maybe you're relevant to a certain actor group, maybe you're relevant to a part of our network, so that you can use whatever you want and change, change the, uh, the focus each one. From my daily workflow perspective, it's kind of like this, starting down around the bottom left area, where uh, hunters will come in and review the report that we created from our own custom content. And if they find anything that looks interesting and possibly malicious, we'll get um, ready, triage, uh, collect the relevant information, and send over to the incident response side of the team. And that's where a case will be created, and they run that to ground and we'll work next area to figure out what happened there. Um, once we looked at the data that we produced in our own morning, we'll then switch over to the research. So, uh, you know, the main kind of ice and network track, there's a lot to set to the area that are going to be tapped yet. So, that will usually result in content being developed on new detections that will show up on the daily dashboard. We cycle constantly trying to explore the data for the This is an image that uh, I cropped to exactly one megapixel. So, it's got one million pixels. If you were to every pixel, screen and consider it an IP address. This would be a one million IP address network. So visually it's, it's, it's 
kind of amazing to look at that and go, wow, yeah, every, every spec on the screen is a computer. That's a lot of machines. Um, to illustrate the scale here, 200 servers could fit inside that little light over on the shoreline. Um, you've got, you know, a limited amount of time in a given day to find evil, all right, you're ready, set, go, right? Uh, so you have a pretty good plan for how you're going to do each day, how you're going to tackle the data. Triple the size of that, right? We're in a 3 million IP network. So now that group of 200 servers is barely visible over on the shoreline there. So you can have to you know, tackle where is that network around 100 servers, it's still a spec of the network. And so you have to get clever with how you conquer things and, and flush those out. Um, the numbers you see to be against you when you look at this, it's a little overwhelming. You think, how am I going to hunt through all that in a day? And so that's where we use those numbers for advance. I'll talk about that in a minute. Well, we split our hunting into two different approaches. Uh, TTP hunting, where we're looking for attacker tools, techniques, procedures. Uh, and we also do anomaly hunting, where we're purely looking for rare occurrences of certain behaviors or artifacts. So I'll go into those briefly here. So this is where the different behavioral signatures to look for. Things that we know and uh, that would be based on experience. Um, source for so so map. So we can then use the of the techniques here, we need to follow those actor groups. So we can use the actor groups that are the known to be associated with a certain actor group. So it's a way of developing this whole thing. So switching gears here, anomaly hunting, this is where we're looking for rare behaviors. This all starts with a lot of groundwork where we're tagging the different types of critical assets in the network uh, with a description. And those descriptions are put into different tools we use, like packet capture and NetFlow uh, and other, other types of tools. And so once we have those IP addresses tagged with a description of what the, what the machine is, we can then start writing rules around, well, show me where there's only a few of a certain kind of machine doing a certain behavior. And I'll give you that more in just a minute here. Uh, but we're, we're taking, we're utilizing a lot of large numbers here, which is where we're, we're imagine you take a slice of any given network or any given um, set of machines on a network you have to assume that the, the traffic and the logs on those machines are probably benign, probably not compromised. And if we assume that that's true, that most things that happen on a network are benign, then logic would tell you that we need to look at things that are not you know, across large numbers of machines, we're looking for those rare behaviors. And uh, like Jason said, uh, you know, rare doesn't mean bad, but usually when something bad happens, it does result in sort of rare artifact. So focus on the rare things, Access a certain easily to find those things. That's why the key compare those against. So I would recommend people start small to make it for the starting Uh, it's not a protocol, but it's 
actually a characteristic of the traffic itself. So there are different characteristics listed there. You can see here there would be drop off from 33,000 down to five. Um, by having these large numbers of similar machines, it helps us realize how significant those small numbers are. If you're in a really small network, you do not have enough machines to really have a there's some what's really rare. When we get into the tens of thousands of a certain kind of machine, it's the oddball. And I'll let you see on the screen here. Um, and lastly, um, so just complete the review of the data that shows up on okay. uh, Instead of going through and performing different checks on a domain name, let's say, to see if it's malicious, um, let's automate that. So we've got a data a scientist on the team who's um, the power shell would write a bunch of modules that score individual characteristics. So for, if a, a domain shows up on our stage two, um, you have to know if that thing were a week old or six months old. So those kinds of things associate their score with those and then sum up those scores into a descending sort so that the highest scoring artifacts show up at the top. So that's prioritized totally every day because we a single thing on the UN dashboard. So at least lets us know that we're looking at the most important things first. So that is uh, everything I've Thank you, Vernon. Yes. The other information through ViperMonkey open source to help the community, are you looking at sharing any of these other analysis and automation tools or those kind of advantages? Yeah, so, so the question was, similar to how we share Viper Monkey, how do we share things like this? So um, in a, actually in a few different ways. Um, so if it's not something that we've intentionally built an open source project around, um, I know Vernon has actually given this presentation at the RSA conference last year. So if you're not familiar with the RSA conference, you know, 40,000-ish security practitioners come together once a year in San Francisco and listen to talks from other security practitioners. So we will talk about things like this. We also um, foster relationships across industry and government with other security practitioners where we will share what is working well in our environment. And conversely, you know, we do that because we want to learn what's working well in their environment. Again, you know, we don't look at these types of things as any type of competitive advantage but rather um, an opportunity to contribute to the greater good, you know, the information security community of practice. It's um, information security is a, it's a large field, but compared to the rest of tech, it's relatively small. So we, we tend to know a lot of the same people. So we'll, we'll share it through those types of informal channels, but great question. Yes, sir. How much does ben, uh, sharing those types of technologies benefit you in return from getting information back from the larger community? Yeah, so the question was, how much does sharing benefit us in return? Um, it, pretty significantly because, you know, when you're sharing intelligence and you're sharing sensitive topics like here's the bad things that we're seeing in our environment, those conversations really are they're based on trust relationships. Um, and the more transparent that you're willing to be with your peers across the industry, typically that's what you're going to see um, in return as well. Um, you know, and, and in cases where we are engaging, you know, with open source, there's others that come in and start contributing to those projects. Mm -hmm. So we certainly benefit from those contributions as well. Great question. Yes, sir. Is the uh Two-pronged approach to hunting the TTP and anomaly uh, hunting approach, is that unique for an organization of your scale or is that pretty common? So Vernon, the question was, is the two-pronged approach unique for an organization of our scale or is that pretty common? I'll, I'll defer to you on that. <coughs> Sure. Um, so the TTP approach is definitely more common. Um, when I've talked in conferences and with other other people in this space, um, the anomaly hunting is not something you hear people doing when we bring it up. Uh, it kind of opens people's eyes, and, and it's really quite simple. Um, if you have even proxy logs and an SQL database, you can do this. Query to use out there for people to use, um, and it. From what I've experienced, though, not a lot of other people are doing that. I think, um, like, like we are, once people do start doing that, they're going to realize that, yeah, there's some work that's associated with the boost and challenge in um, 
tuning the results. Um, as you can see, only three machines can do something one day. The next day, you see three machines. Is it, is it the same three? Is it a different three? How do you tune those out so that filtering out? I think we have about five minutes left. Other questions? Yes. How do you review third-party contractors from cybersecurity perspective? Great question. So the question was, how do we review third-party contractors from a cybersecurity perspective? There's not one answer. Um, a number of different ways. The, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of different variables, and that's, those are how is that third party going to be connected to us or not? What kind of information are we sharing with that third party or not? And depending on those two variables will largely dictate how we're going to review those. So we do have a process that reviews any new technology, application, hardware, et cetera, coming into our environment um, that's very extensive. If it's not something coming into our environment, but something that we're sharing out or somebody that we're allowing to connect in, um, depending on the nature of that engagement, it could be anything from a security questionnaire where we're asking them to answer a fairly straightforward set of questions or to provide some type of attestation as to what their security posture looks like, uh, all the way up to an on-site assessment where I send people into their environment to assess their security program. If it's something where they're writing code for us, then we're going to look at the code uh, the same way that we're going to look at code that's developed um, internally. Great question. Yes, sir. So even with all of these technologies and tools, what advantage does the adversary still have over like, all of this infrastructure? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. But even with all of these tools and technologies, what advantage adversary still has over of this knowledge base? Like, what yeah, so the question was, even with all the tools and technologies, what's the advantage that the adversary has? Um, it, it, so, you know, there's not a, a level playing field. Um, the adversary tends to understand what organizations are doing to defend themselves with far more clarity than we always understand what the adversary is going to do. Um, you know, the adversary doesn't necessarily have to work a set schedule. We don't know what part of the world they're coming from. You know, they, they gain a lot of advantage just from the unknowns. Um, which is why we engage in some of these, how do you find the unknowns in your environment? Because you can't rely upon technologies alone to defend um, your organization. You have to think creatively as to how do we identify the things we just wouldn't know about, you know, such as some random adversary that's decided to enter the world of cybercrime on the other side of the world that's unknown to, to everybody, but, you know, has figured out a new way to um, attack an organization. So adversaries absolutely, uh, they absolutely have advantages, you know, in, in many number of ways. What's really interesting, and in, in Vernon or Harold alluded to it when he was talking about A-B testing, you know, there's very few super hackers in the world. Um, they, they work in an ecosystem just like a business does. You have people that, you know, specialize in malware development. You have people that specialize in deployment. You have people that specialize in exploitation, people that specialize in, in exfiltration. Um, you know, that's why they do the A-B testing. I mean, they, they very often, you know, follow <laughs> release cycles. And um, it, it's really interesting to watch how they work. They work in many cases, just like you would expect to see an enterprise application development organization working. Yes, sir. Did you just tell us that there is a Walmart of cyber something or other <laughs> sitting out there that's anticipating and working to counter many of the things that you all do? The, so, there, so the question was, is, is there a Walmart of cyber criminals? I don't know that I would describe it quite that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> My PR group probably would bristle at that description. <laughs> um, but no, there absolutely is, we call it the underground economy. There absolutely is an underground economy for cyber criminals. There's crimeware as a service. You know, the, the, there, there are people that specialize in selling, um, you know, data that's been stolen. Um, in fact, there was a release I saw today where there's a well-known 
cyber, well-known cyber actor that goes by um, Joker, and he uh, runs an underground economy website called Joker Stash. And he, well, how many credit cards did he release today? Thirty million. Thirty million. What? Thirty million credit cards that he released just today. He didn't do those breaches. He didn't exfiltrate that data. He didn't write the mal code um, that breached those organizations. He just runs the platform to sell the goods. Yes. So you anticipate and, uh, and find patches to find some of these uh, vulnerabilities. At what point do you say, hey, Something has happened, this event happened, and now I need to pass it on to maybe federal agency for criminal, criminal investigation or legal action. Yeah, so the question is, when we have an event, at what point do, would we notify the authorities? So it really depends on the scenario. So we're gonna, you know, we work with our investigations groups corporately, um, you know, and anything that crosses a criminal threshold, um, we're typically going to share that with, you know, the appropriate entity. Um, if, if for nothing else from an intelligence perspective. You know, we'll often see, I mean, the, just trying to break into our network in and of itself is a crime, but it's unlikely that that's going to be pursued because the actor's probably on the other side of the world and we've not actually suffered a financial loss at that point. So it's difficult to, um, difficult to establish yourself as a victim when you are not actually suffered a loss, but technically what they've done is a crime. Um, but the volume of that, you know, is not anything that any law enforcement agency would scale to. So they're going to go after, you know, the worst of the worst offenders, the Joker stash, like I just described. Good question. Yes. Uh, what do you do to stay active, like stay current on this massive volume of information that comes in every day? So, so from my leadership role, what do I do to stay current? I read a lot. Um, you know, I have, um, I have teams that brief me regularly on what is emergent, you know, in the intelligence space, in the threat space. Um, you know, it's impossible to stay up with everything. Um, you know, so I'm really most interested in what's relevant to our organization. What has an intersection point with our brand, our people, our technology stack? our consumers, our apps, you know, those types of things. So, it, you know, for, I'm fortunate enough to have a team that curates that, um, you know, to tell me, here, here's the things you need to be aware of. Um, you know, Jason on screen there, he walks down to my office at least a couple times a day just to give me a heads up on something, so. So when you see Jason coming, do, do, do you automatically no. get frightened? No. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Uh, but it's funny that you ask that, though, because I, I unfortunately have that effect when I walk down our executive row sometimes. Um, I've had to condition our leadership that, hey, I'm not always here to deliver bad news. Um, <laughs> you know, but that is a risk that you run. And, and, and candidly, if you decide to get, pursue a career as a security practitioner, that's a piece of advice that I'd give you is, you know, don't always be the bearer of bad news. There's a lot of really good things that occur in an information security practice, and you got to celebrate the wins, too. Um, you know, because if you're the person that's always coming to, you know, be the harbinger of a bad thing, people are going to get really tired of seeing you in a, in a, in a short period of time. But I think there was another question over here. So uh, I know you have a Background. Yes. I'm going to ask you a General Mattis question here. Okay. What, is there a threat or a type of attack that, that keeps you up at night? So I get the what keeps you up at night question uh, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, you know, candidly, the thing that keeps me up at night is, is not a specific threat actor. It's not a specific threat. It is the almost unknowable question of what are we missing? You know, what are we not thinking about? What did we not consider? What did we not think about from the proper perspective? Um, you know, those are the things that, that I think about. And fortunately, I have a great team that thinks the same way, um, you know, and manages these things, you know, very effectively. So I'm not up at night often um, because, you know, I've got a team of dedicated professionals that, you know, that's, that's what they do, and they do it really well. But it's always the it's always the what don't we know? What are we missing? Yes, sir. 
to people who are totally external to you who set up fake Walmart sites or fake Walmart emails and things like that. I'm sure there's got to be tons of that. That's yeah. totally external to your physical organization. Yeah. Do you pursue that? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question was, what do we do with people that set up fake Walmart sites, fake Walmart emails? Um, a couple of things. So the fake sites, um, we use third-party takedown services that work with the ISPs that will um, then take those sites down, um, just based on an intellectual property infringement claim. And those usually come down fairly quickly. If they're out on some bulletproof hosting site, um, there, there, is, uh, there are services that are offered from some of the big technology companies that will just block that. So the, the majority of the internet can't actually successfully navigate to it. Where emails and domains are concerned, um, we actually use uh, uh, DMARC. So DMARC is uh, essentially a, an open source technology that allows you to electronically sign anything coming from your domain. Um, and if it does not have the proper signatures coming from an, someone who's authorized to send on behalf of your domain, it just gets dropped before it gets delivered and we can actually track the efficacy of that um, pretty well. You know, and it's, it's amazing because it's, while there's a lift to implement it, and there's typically process changes to implement it within organizations. It's stunning. It's free. It's stunning the number of organizations that don't do it. Um, and from a brand and reputation perspective alone, that's plenty of reason to, to put DMARC in place. And it's, it's well established. It's pretty straightforward. There's tons of documentation out online for it. But that's how we approach that one. Great question. I, I think we're out of time. Um, any Last question, I probably squeeze in one more. <clears throat> yes. What policies do you find are most overlooked in cybersecurity? What policies, what policies are, are most overlooked? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, so my individual who owns our policies, he, he often jokes that the best way to protect your crown jewels is to label it security policies and just sit it out on the internet and no one will ever touch it. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's true. Um, so what we find is, you know, a developer is not going to take the time to go read 400 pages of security policies and standards. Really what's incumbent upon us is to not, to, to create an environment where they don't have to go look, but rather codify what we expect in terms of our policies being implemented and executed so that it's easy for developers. So that all they've got to do is an API call or, or use a certain library that we've written that we say, hey, if you just use this library, you'll meet the identity and access management uh, security policies and standards. And you know what? And you don't even have to write the code. Just use that library. And it's like the easy button for them. You know, it, it, for those of you that are developers, you know if somebody's already written it for you and it works, you're going to use it. So that's really where, um, that's where I think the thinking has to shift within an information security organizations is stop trying to enforce everybody to go and abide by everything you've published, but make it easy for them to consume so it's easier for them to follow um, the, what you expect them to do. But great question. One last question. So students are interested in Walmart. How can they get in touch with, with folks? You know, if they're interested in internships or they're interested in, you know, learning more about your... Yeah, sure. So if you're interested in um, roles, opportunities, we, we, we have a career portal out there where we publish all of our positions. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm out on LinkedIn. Um, you know, my email's just first name dot last name at walmart.com. Um, Nolan certainly is a conduit back uh, to the company, um, so we're we're not hard to reach if you have an interest. Um, if there is an interest in internships, um, that follows a little bit more of a formal um, process. But you know, if you get your name to us, then we get you plugged in with the right people. So on that note, please let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. I assume that you'll be around for five or seven minutes. I'll be around for a few minutes.
So thank you all again for talking. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Harold Vernon. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.